Columbus Day is dead. It's gone. We got rid of it, right? It's Indigenous Peoples Day now. How do you feel about that one? Well, as an Italian, I take great offense. Christopher Columbus was a great Guinea, Wap, Dago, um, whom us Italians love very much. <laughs> and, uh, there's been a there's been a lot of propaganda, and I just like I just showed conclusively in the last segment, the media is lying to you. Indigenous Peoples Rebellion in southern Mexico. That in the mid '90s, they they took over Chiapas, the su southernmost state in Mexico, and they've been running yeah. the area democratically ever since. Um, Cuando irrumpimos e interrumpimos en 1994 con sangre y fuego, no iniciaba la guerra para nosotras, nosotros los zapatistas. Que es un movimiento para todos, que defendemos nuestras tierras. We defend our land, our natural resources, our mother earth. So, this is uh, one of the sort of current iterations of anarchism in action in the world today. There's a few more that we'll get to eventually at some point, but um, I wanted to talk about the Zapatistas this week. This is an area that is um, majority indigenous population, and they have a long history of uh, re revolutions, actually. Let me see if I can show a picture of Chiapas here. Bam, there it is. The southernmost state in, China, in uh, Mexico here. It's also the poorest state in Mexico, I should say. Yeah, right beside, uh, right beside Guatemala down there. So I guess that's the entry point for all the Central American refugees that kind of come come up through Chiapas. Uh, well, yeah, any any sort of um, refugees on the way to America for sure, over to the U.S. I should say. I want to go through a little bit of the history. I'll try to do this quickly. Um, the Mexico, most people don't really know, but Mexico was a one-party dictatorship, essentially, for uh, most of its lifespan since independence from Spain. The PRI ruled Mexico since the 1920s, and they, they took up the mantle of a left-wing party, but you know how that goes. It started out as a left-wing party, slowly moved to the right, as these things do. Um, these, these days, it's a corporatist, authoritarian party. And in 69, 1969, the FLN formed in northern Mexico under Cesar Munoz. And they operated in Chiapas, among other places. This was the beginning. Uh, this was the uh, second revolution, sort of. In 1974, a battle between the Mexican army and the FLN took place. Some members of the FLN were tortured and executed by the Mexican army. And this really, this crushed the FLN. They were... They were, they were gone after that. Some of the members, the more uh, revolutionary members, formed a new organization, the EZLN, which is the uh, Zapatista Army of National Liberation, the Zapatistas. There are members in the north in the urban areas that are non-indigenous, and then there are the indigenous members um, in Chiapas, and they are both part of the EZLN. They travel around and have uh, sort of meetings and stuff, you know, how them lefty guys are. They love their meetings. This formed um, with the help of the liberation theology movement. Um, have you heard of this? I have, actually. Liberation theology has been described as an interpretation of Christian faith out of the experience of the poor. The best known form of liberation theology is that which developed in Latin America in the 1950s. However, various other forms of liberation theology have since developed, including Asian black, and Palestinian liberation theologies. Latin American liberation theology met opposition in the United States, which accused it of using Marxist concepts. The Vatican rejected certain forms of Latin American liberation theology for focusing on institutionalized or systemic sin, and for identifying Catholic Church hierarchy in South America as members of the same privileged class that had long been oppressing indigenous populations from the arrival of Pizarro onward. Popularized, somewhat popularized by Amy Goodman um, from Democracy Now! She reported on it. 
And um, in 1994, on January 1st, the day that NAFTA went into effect, the Zapatistas declared war, essentially declared war on the uh, Mexican government. Because NAFTA, among other things, this is a neoliberal trade agreement that a ton of United States uh, jobs went to Mexico, hurt workers in the United States. It also hurt workers in Mexico, in particular the indigenous people who were, they were supposed to be given land in these um, agrarian reforms. Well, well, specifically what happened in, with this, uh, for Mexico, because Mexico initially was, was not going to join NAFTA, I guess it's like a full partner. Um, this was obviously during Clinton's uh, administration. Mm -hmm. um, what they required uh, Mexico to do was to change, I forget the section, I, I was trying to remember it, but it was a change a part of their constitution. The, uh, the section in particular. Article 27 of the Mexican okay. constitution is what's okay. listed here. So you, yeah, so you, you've got it. Uh, and it, what it did, it, it provided uh, certain parts of, of certain segments of, of land to be used as public land. And this was very important for the very poor, the indigenous peoples, where they could go there, they could grow crops, they could make some sort of living off of it. They didn't have to buy the land. It was just theirs by virtue of them having lived there and having access to it. And uh, so the change to the Constitution would get away, would, would do away with this public land and would basically put it up for I think my understanding was it would require that it be put up for sale by the government um, for whomever to buy, you know, and it most likely be some sort of business interest. Uh, not poor indigenous people, people, probably. Most likely not, unless they've been <laughs> hiding their, saving their nickels. Um, but yeah, yeah, so these people kind of, this is one of the things they got upset about, uh, and rightly so. They, they've pushed back and said, hey, you know, we need, we need to keep these things available for the poor indigenous populations so that they can make a living off this land that they've been making a living off of. Anyway. They had been fighting for two decades. They had been fighting for two decades to get any sort of concessions from the Mexican government for the indigenous people that live there. The people who rightly, you know, have more claim to the land than anybody else, certainly. Yeah. Just on a property rights sort of uh, context, you would think. Um, they basically declared war on the uh, Mexican government. 3,000 Zapatista insurgents seized... Uh, most of the states in Chiapas. Here's a nice photograph of some Zapatistas in 94. So small. Yeah. This guy is cheesing for the camera here, pointing the gun at the camera, and this guy behind him is like, grow up. Dude, come on. Get real. Look at that look. So the first thing they did after seizing Chiapas, they freed prisoners in San Cristobal de las Casas, and burned several police buildings and military barracks. And the very next day, the Mexican army attacked them, and they retreated into the jungles um, after taking a lot of casualties. Cathedral of uh, San Cristobal. This is this is one of the areas that's really helped the Zapatistas, one of the the Catholic Church down here. Where's Sagar and Jenny's church? Is he Catholic? No, you said it's the Church of Crystal Ball. Remember, that's his co-host. Oh, oh. Oh, this, oh it's geez. not a great show. Jeez, God, Tony, get off. Here's some no, actual no. footage. Let's see if I can get away with this. They had to go back through the militarized zones. The Mexican army attacked. The Zapatistas retreated into the jungles. On January 12th, so a week and a half later, a ceasefire was called, um, and this was brokered by the Catholic diocese. In February 1955, the Mexican army overran the rem remaining territory the Zapatistas controlled, and they again fled into the jungles. Um, so a year later. And the Zapatistas were under siege for uh, quite a while in the jungles there. But they... Uh, they, they were hanging on, and a stroke of luck, the Mexican um, Secretary of the Interior, Esteban Moctezuma, campaign, campaigned for a peaceful solution to the siege, and he, um, in fact, resigned his position in solidarity with the Zapatistas. This is Moctezuma. He, was, he submitted his resignation, 
in solidarity with the Zapatistas, and that put quite a bit of pressure on the Mexican government. Um, President Zedillo refused to accept his resignation, but decided to heed his calls for a peaceful solution. The main spokesman for the for the Zapatistas, some Comandante Marcos, after the siege was lifted, he was allowed to escape the jungles. So he survived that harrowing situation. He was surrounded in the jungle, and he, he did escape. The Zapatistas survived, and they they brokered peace thanks to uh, President Zedillo and um, and this Moctezuma, Esteban Moctezuma. Amazingly, um, they didn't have a bunch of Navy SEALs come down there and just wipe them out. The U.S. must have been preoccupied at this time, I guess. Yeah. Here's a little bit of Marcos. This is an interview by Zach Del Rocha. Zach Del Rocha's great grandfather fought in the Mexican Revolution, apparently, so he's super interested in these guys. Yeah. These guys were practicing COVID, uh, COVID restrictions back in the day. Or the mask, fellas. El apoyo de la Comisión Nacional para la Democracia y el el uso de el sistema de video para poder mandarles este saludo. ¿no? Así que good luck. I just wanted to check him out. His he's not very yeah. interesting to interview, but that's what he sounds like and that's what he looks like. A new president, a right wing president, in um, the early two thousands. Vincente Fox agreed to withdraw troops from Chiapas because they still had these paramilitaries down there, and they still do. Um, but um, this guy is super interesting, man. Vincente Fox, yeah. he's a right-wing populist Trump guy, but he famously stated that he's not going to pay for the fucking wall because Trump – remember when Trump was like, I'm going to make <laughs> them pay for it. Vincente Fox was like, I'm not going to pay for no fucking wall. Yeah. And he has this picture here. I don't know if he was serious or if he was just trying to garner some international fame. He looks like the hey, type, of, type of guy that... It, it works. I, I, I don't know anything about the guy, uh, but I like him already. <laughs> I don't know. It seems like he would be friends with Trump, but I don't know. What do I know? Of course, He's Trump would fire himself, wouldn't he? Yeah, he would. Later on, he apologized in a Breitbart interview where he called Trump ignorant, crazy, and e egocentric. Um, so Marcos demanded um, in these negotiations that the paramilitary groups in Chiapas be disarmed, obviously. They wanted, uh, they wanted the Mexican military out of Chiapas. In 2001, the Zapatistas marched to Mexico City under President Vicente Fox, and they were pressuring the Mexican Congress to implement these land reforms that they had initially, you know, this was what it was all about, these land reforms to give the peasants some land. Here's the famous photo of Marcos. Damn. Got the cigar. That's uh got a pipe through the mask. Is it is it it's a pipe? Yeah. Yeah. I need a painting like that of myself. Everybody I don't know. I feel like this is a emotional manipulation. You can't have a photo taken in combat fatigues with a pipe on a horse and not have people think you're not a badass. What's with the horse? I mean, I guess because of nature and stuff. Why wouldn't you have a four wheeler? I don't know. I, well, in that interview, he had a horse in the background. I mean, I guess they, I know. They he's, use he's a, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you're going through the jungle. It's you know, I don't. You know, don't have to put they're... gas in the damn thing. I guess I don't know. Uh, they didn't. Have, they never reached a deal with Vicente. Um, the Zapatistas unilaterally created 32 new autonomous municipalities in Chiapas. They had some international funding from um, some some sort of fringe left wing groups that are into this sort of stuff, but they didn't have any government support whatsoever. And since then, they have been trying to basically democratically run uh, Chiapas through these autonomous municipalities in a anarchist fashion. Very cool. Here are is a photo of the municipalities. And they're actually in four or five, depending on what source you look at, um, sort of um, provinces. But these are municipalities of approximately 300 families. Hmm. And we'll go into it a little bit more here in a sec. Let's finish the history. Um, 
In 2005, the Zapatistas presented the Sixth Declaration of the Lacandon Jungle. The document declared their principles and support for indigenous people and solidarity with the people of Cuba, Bolivia, and others. This was a declaration of autonomous intent and solidarity with the working class, uh, essentially. In 2006, the EZLN, or the Zapatistas, participated in demonstrations protesting the forcible removal of flower vendors in Texoco for the construction of a Walmart. The feds bust in 5,000 agents to fight the Zapatistas supporting these flower vendors. Following days saw 216 arrests, 30 rape accusations against the police, five deportations, and one casualty, a 14-year-old boy. Shortly after, another person died after being in a coma from being struck in the head with a tear gas canister. In 2006 and 7, Marcos continued to garner support from other indigenous groups in the Americas. And in 2009, the Zapatistas declared their support for the Palestinians. They're doing it, man. They, they did it before anybody else, uh, the modern ones. Looks like the, uh, reminds me of the Boy Scouts, the Boy Scout uniforms we had back in the day. Yeah. This is probably Troop 22 or something. <laughs> They're working on their uh, merit badges. <laughs> Jungle combat merit badge. Rode a horse for five miles. Strangled a, strangled a capitalist farm owner with my bare hands. In 2012, so this is three years later, 40,000 Zapatistas and Zapatista supporters marched throughout the states of Chiapas in solidarity. They, these were called the silent marches. They must be doing something right to have all this free time marching around. Well, they're not pursuing um, material interests, I imagine. Could you imagine having that sort of... Uh... A sort of left wing organization in the US. Man. You could get you could get large percentages of the population together to, to march forty thousand people to another. Right. Oh. Yeah. Forty thousand people to march on a major city. Just silently just walk through it. Well man, All so many people man. around so many people around the world have uh spoke out in support of them, you know. Of course the same is true of the Palestinians, it's just a different situation. Um, the Zapatistas continuously documented attacks and assassinations against indigenous leaders and supported uh, and supporters throughout Chiapas. This uh, different, the Mexican military is split up into these different organizations like the army, the navy. They all carry out independent missions. Uh, there's a lot of paramilitaries, I'm sure, with private funding down there, attacking indigenous people. Uh, but they try to document all this stuff. In 2014, Marcos declared that his position of leadership had been a hologram and was no longer. This was interpreted by the international community that, to mean that he was announcing his retirement. Um, but he's still around. He, he, he announces retirement, but he's still around. He goes by Gal, uh, Galeno. Galeano. How do, you, how do you say it? He changed his name after his buddy died to his buddy's name. He's a writer. He was a writer and rotating self-government with their own autonomous education system, autonomous health care system, production cooperatives and societies, the recovery of the local economy, their own system of administration of justice, in other words, their own legal system, which is much fairer than the federal Mexican legal system, uh, tremendous promotion of young people and of women into uh, uh, positions of importance in the self-government process. So it's really exciting to see what is possible to achieve uh, if you control your own territory and if you have a different vision of how society could be organized. The Zapatistas had, uh, they had intended to stay out of politics, uh, but they have, they're sort of a political force down there now. And in 2017, uh, they selected a woman, Maria Martinez, to run for president. She didn't get enough signatures. They need 866,000 signatures to get on the ballot down there, and she wasn't able to. Um, but in 2017, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador founded Morena. This is the new progressive party in Mexico, and they are in power uh, to this day, Morena. And in 2019, Marcos announced expansion of the EZLN into 11 new districts. Moreno President Lopez Obrador stated that the expansion was welcome, provided it was done without violence. And that's what the Zapatistas have been saying for, for like over a decade now. They're, they're trying to avoid any sort of violence. 
And here's the president, the Morena president, Oberdor. Just a little bit of him. He's pretty cool, man. Mexico has an extraordinary history. It is a story of a struggle for freedom, for justice, for equality, a struggle to defend our national sovereignty. In the history of Mexico, there are three major transformations. The first was independence. So he's talking about the revolutions. Cool guy, man. All right, let's talk about the political structure a little bit. So the Zapatistas are still not officially recognized by Mexico, and there are privately funded paramilitary groups that operate in the area. And their whole goal is to break up the Zapatista movement. Women are an integral part of society in Chiapas. Because this is pretty similar. What they're doing here is pretty similar to what I advocate for. The autonomous municipalities. There are, they're called the MAREZ, M-A-R-E-Z, that's an acronym. They're coordinated by autonomous councils, and their main objectives have been to promote education and health in the territories. They also fight for land rights, labor and trade, housing and fuel supply issues. They promote the arts, especially indigenous art, and they administer justice. So the MAREZ here on the bottom, these are 300 families, um, approximately 300 families per MAREZ. These are sort of like um, cities or counties that we have here. They, uh, in negotiations, they strive for a consensus, so they argue until they can get a consensus or get close. Um, but if they can't, they will fall back to a majority. The Marez itself, so the county, owns the private property. Not the personal property, but the private property. So that would be factories, um, anything that requires multiple people to operate. So farmland. Um, factories, that sort of thing. Each Marez has their own laws, and they enforce their own laws with their own law enforcement officials. Um, and they pay taxes to the municipality in which they are for services the municipality provides, such as, you know, uh, health care and roads, things that require coordination between uh, Marez. And they call the um, they call the municipalities here the councils of good government. These are the people who actually carry out the decisions that are made at the municipalities. And the way federation works, um, instead of the Marez here, instead of them electing representatives to be in the municipality congress or whatever, they have delegates, and the delegates have to do what they're told. And in federation, instead of sort of the municipalities voting on issues, each municipality that is affected by potential legislation has to agree. It has to be a consensus. So if they want to build a road that goes through all four municipalities, then all four municipalities would have to agree. That's how federation uh, works. So that way, you know, one, three municipalities couldn't pass a law that says we're going to enslave the, you know, the, the last municipality. Not really that complicated. It's just instituting. Whoops. How did I go there? Oh, Michael Malice. No, it, it's it's not. And uh, that's kind of what, what it intrigues me and worries me about, about stuff like that. Like, yeah, it seems all very. It, it seems a bit too simple. Um, well, it's, it's just instituting there, direct democracy principles as much as possible. That should be the goal, right? Okay, Why is that okay. not the goal? I, I would say, no, I, I agree with that as much as possible. Um, I, I don't know. I, I don't know, but I just, I would worry. I would think there's a lot of, there's a lot of complicated, there's a lot of complexity to government on the higher stages. Sure. And, uh, Shoot. I just, What's your issue? Let's do it. Okay. Uh, Law. Go wrong. I mean, what? What? Each Marez has allowed, their own laws, right? They're, they're allowed to make whatever laws they want, or yeah, or I, are I they suppose. are they bound by some sort of constitution on on the higher end? Um, I would advocate for a bill of rights, a national bill yeah. of rights, but that's just me. I, I, what I'm advocating for this is loose, right? They this is 
the indigenous Zapatistas. They're they're not. This isn't like hard in stone. I'm just I'm going to advocate for my position. Basically, um, I would I would advocate for a bill of rights. But yeah, essentially, um, you know, principles of direct democracy. You can pass whatever law you want as long as you're not infringing on other people's you know rights. Okay, I mean, so that would have to be a law that you you can't infringe on other people's rights. Sure, I guess if you need to make okay. that law, yeah, sure. I mean, I think you would, because that's, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, what if uh, Michael Malice again coming up? I know, it's on my to tell playlist, us, I guess. Tell us what's going on. Uh, <laughs> listen, we need to have big corporations to come in there and let them make their laws, and you can, whatever, I don't know. Uh, corporations I mean, yeah, I uh, could operate as co-ops. They would be co-ops, they would um, be paid by the municipality. Or the county, whatever, however you want to say it, and um, the, the municipality would distribute uh, goods to um, the community. Actually, the Marez, I guess, would distrib distribute. So envision this. Yeah, I, mean, I do yeah. like the idea of delegates over representatives. For sure. I yeah, we, I mean, we that need seems to do that obvious. a lot more. I, yeah, it is. It really is obvious. And the way I know. Let me put this one more time back up. I know how he, how here it says councils of good government at the top. The councils of good government is literally just people that the municipalities agree upon. Like they need people to carry out these laws. So they say they pass a law to build a new hospital or whatever, right? So the people they would send to go build the hospital, you'd have to have officials, and that's the councils of good government. So they're not above the municipality and the Marez. They're they're literally the 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 tools of of the municipalities. See, it's, it's, this is confusing for me to talk about because municipalities, in my mind, are the counties or the Mareses. But in, here, in Chiapas, they call them Mareses. The municipalities are the, the regions, right? Yeah. A little confusing, but... Yeah, I wonder how they deal with, uh, like, big corporate interests. You know, um, they, some corporation comes down there and they say, hey, we want this Merez. You've got... Some minerals underneath. Well, there's no there. private property. They can't buy it. It's not for okay, sale. Then. The Merez owns everything. No, the Merez, they say, hey, we're going to give everybody here, the poor indigenous farmers, we're going to give you all $10,000. 10000 times 300, that's what, $30 million. $30 million is nothing for an oil company. We're going to give $30 million and hmm. we're going to buy the rights to this land. And now you have to work. You know, like there's, there's so many ways. Obviously, they're, it's not, ha I, I, my understanding is, it's not happening there, but... Well, they don't have any oil. It's a very poor region. Maybe that's why they're still alive and kicking down there. You hey, know? hey, we're going to we're gonna cut down this uh, this bit of jungle and, and plant some banana farms. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I don't have any... Well, if it was in the Bill of Rights, I, if it was in the Bill of Rights that uh, there's no private property, then that wouldn't be an issue. They wouldn't be allowed to sell the, the property. Okay, so... So they can't... Or in the national constitution, however you want to so sort of the, phrase it. The, the Merez doesn't own it then. The Merez does own all the private property in that. The Merez area. would be able to sell it on a and by own I mean, basis. It's a communal system, right? They don't own it in terms of like they couldn't sell it out from under the residents because I mean it's the the, the Merez is run by the residents. They all okay, the residents I mean, would agree to sell to Texaco or something, is what you're saying. I, they could. I mean, if if Texaco I guess. comes down there, started. I mean. Look, man, this happens in the U.S. all the time. Misinformation. You go around there, start spreading lies, start throwing money around, sure. promising people jobs, promising promising the world, and you know what? What recourse do they have? What what protects them? And this is this is where you just you kind of I feel like you kind of need federal legislation and and direct democracy kind of falters because this is what we were talking about with Facebook. You know, people are easily manipulated, and somebody would sell out. Oh, I think a lot of people would. I mean, it's not happening, so there's something holding it back. I mean, like, I've got, I don't have critiques of it. I just have questions about how they're, how they're dealing. How they with would survive issues. in a global environment is what is yeah, really your yeah. question. Yeah, it's yeah. A good I, mean, question. I, I mean, there's a reason. There's not too many of these things. Yeah. There's, there's one in in Europe, and there's one here um, in Mexico. I mean, I, major, I think you would uh, also. It, it probably works in a place like that. I am guessing. Uh, they just have such a, a, it's probably almost a cultural thing. You know, we can work out all these problems, but there's this culture of uh, 
this is our land, communal ownership. We deal with our problems internally. We deal with, you know, we, we don't want the influence. This, the whole point of this is that we're we're pushing back against the outside influence. Though. But this, it's literally just me making stuff up right now. I don't, I don't know. Well, see, if you try to sell out your uh, community members, your, um, your your coworkers, here comes Marcos on his horse. Hey, what are you doing, buddy? I'm very yeah. disappointed in you. But all these Merezes, look, they all just got free Wi-Fi. Now they're on Facebook, and they're getting all these memes talking about how, <laughs> I don't know, what's, <laughs> what's their version of, oh, you can't say uh, Marxist, because then they'd be like, yeah, of course he's a Marxist. Or they there. don't associate themselves with any movement, including the anarchist movement. Okay, well, but just wait till Facebook gets a hold of it. That's all I'm saying. You're right about that. I've Demac I've Demac thought about direct democracy is out the window once you have Dude. Facebook manipulation. The al the almighty algorithm. The capitalist media single handedly brought down the Soviet Union. I mean, this is a serious issue that <laughs> we can discuss at length. But yeah, I agree with you. I mean, um, 